Hey guys, what's up here? Um, now let's talk about bowel obstruction. Um, so a bowel obstruction is also, and also you might see it called an intestinal obstruction. Um, it is effectively where usually um, either in the small bowel, um, which is like the small intestine, or in the large bowel or the large intestine, there is a blockage. Um, and what happens when a blockage occurs, regardless of the cause, is, is that the body recognizes there's a blockage and it works really hard to try to bypass it. Like think of it like, you know, it's trying to get stuff flowing, get stuff moving again, but um, kind of think of it like with heart failure, you know, I'm always going to bring it back to cardiac. Um, but um, it's like heart failure where your body tries to compensate and help, but everything that it does to try to help or to get things moving again, um, actually make things worse. And then it gets tired, swollen and um, uh, exhausted and eventually just quits, stops working. Um, so a bowel obstruction, uh, it, it, it's fairly common that you're gonna see people admitted for this if you're working in somewhere that would get GI-like patients, um, but it, it is easily fixed if caught and treated um, and everything man and managed well, um, but definitely can lead to some uncomfortable symptoms and possible, um, you know, life-threatening consequences if not taken care of. Um, so there's two different types of uh, bowel obstruction. There's what's known as a mechanical obstruction, which means there's something actually blocking the path. Now, nine times out of 10, what's blocking the path is what are called adhesions. And adhesions are like after surgery, just the way that your bowel tissue is, think of it like scar tissue after surgery. And so um, these happen often. And so it can lead to um, blockages in the bowels. Um, hernias can cause blockages, tumors, and then like people, that have um, inflammatory bowel like Crohn's can end up getting strictures, which can also create an obstruction. There's also what's known as a non-mechanical um, bowel obstruction. And this is where there's a blood flow to the bowel issue. Um, and then um, there's like no peristalsis, no squeeze. And so what, why this would happen, um, you know, there's what's called a paralytic ileus. And usually those are a result of a neuromuscular issue. Um, and then also it's possible you can get blood clots in the blood vessels that supply your um, intestines. So um, it can definitely lead to that. So um, uh, what do you call it? Um, this can happen for a variety of reasons. You want to think about like blood flow, uh, blood flow issues. Like we talked about with diabetes, there's blood flow issues with spinal issues. Um, and then again, sometimes it can be a clot, but, um, effectively mechanical, there's actually something physically in the way or non-mechanical is, is there's no squeeze or peristalsis. And that's why there's an obstruction. There's an obstruction of the squeeze or the movement of the bowels. Um, so what are we going to expect to find? So there's actually four hallmark or what are seen as like the classic picture of bowel obstruction. Um, the first one is going to be abdominal pain, and it's usually described as a colicky pain. If you don't know what a colicky pain is, um, it's uh, what do you call them? It? Um, it's a uh, we could, if you've never had a colicky baby, if you had a colicky baby, you'd um, understand it a little bit better. But um, abdom abdominal pain, that's usually very severe. And um, uh, what do you call them? Um, it's sometimes it can be kind of continuous and won't stop. Um, but it, it's very nagging pain. Um, and then uh, nausea vomiting is the other one of the other classic symptoms distension, and then constipation as well. Because of course, if my bowels aren't moving, nothing's going to be coming out. And whether my bowels aren't moving because something's blocking it or my bowels aren't moving, um, because there's nothing there's something that's blocking the ability for it to squeeze or have peristalsis. Um, it doesn't matter which one it is at the end of the day, um, this can lead to a lot of problems. Um, what we're going to also note in this patient is, is that there's bowel sounds that are hyperactive or very active above the obstruction, um, whereas after the obstruction, they will be absent or um, decreased. And then if there's a paralytic ileus, um, that's again where there's no peristalsis, of course, there's going to be absent bowel sounds. Um, so it kind of depends on the cause. And the reason they're hyperactive above the obstruction is remember what I said, where the body's trying so hard to get things moving. So that hyperactivity is the body trying, like giving its last fight saying like, let's try to get things moving. Um, these patients also commonly can have a low grade fever. So as a result of that, of course, my priority assessments, bowel sounds, pain assessment, look for other symptoms. A lot of times they can have nausea, vomiting because there's a blockage, stuff can't move forward. So it backs up and like heart failure. And then um, 
that can end up um, vomiting and getting really nauseous because stuff is building up and it has nowhere else to go. Um, you definitely want to assess em emesis and see if there's any sort of infection, odor, bleeding, that kind of stuff. Um, we're going to assess the contour of the abdomen with um, a bad bowel obstruction. There can be perforation. Um, so we're going to be looking for those signs of peritonitis. We want to ask them when their last bowel movement was, and then look for signs of um, infection, look for signs of shock and things like that. We want to check their blood pressure and their heart rate. Because again, depending on where the bowel obstruction is, it could lead to lack of absorption of nutrients, lack of absorption of fluids. And so this patient could be dehydrated. Um, uh, you know, so we want to keep a close eye on everything. Uh, priority labs that we're going to check are going to be checking the white blood cell count. Um, it can indicate um, strangulation or perforation of the bowels. Um, we also want to check the hemoglobin because it may indicate there's some sort of bleeding somewhere with all the inflammation that goes on with the bowel obstruction. And there's a lot of swelling. Um, there can be dead bowel. So we want to check for that. We want to check the electrolytes, especially if they're nauseous and vomiting. And then we're going to be concerned about dehydration. So we want to check kidney function. And we'll usually do an abdominal x-ray like a KUB um, and maybe a CT scan as well. So a bowel obstruction is going to be um, considered getting better if their pain is better, decreased other symptoms, there's less bloating, less distension. Um, and especially we want to see, because a lot of these are managed conservatively where we just kind of, we stick an NG tube in them and just, you know, um, let it kind of pass on its own and it'll find a way to... Um, I was going to say revive itself, but <laughs> to get back to normal function, um, but being able to pass gas, like you would never think we would be so preoccupied with someone's um, uh, gas or flatulence. Um, but when someone has a bowel obstruction, like it's the golden question, Hey, have you farted? And so um, we definitely want to know about that. And have they had a bowel movement? Um, a client with a bowel obstruction is getting worse if they have increased or worsening pain, um, increased other symptoms like nausea, vomiting, bloating, distension. Um, and then, we're, of course, we're going to look for those signs of complication. So we're looking for perforation, peritonitis. Um, we're looking for signs of fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So again, those double Ds, the dehydration and dysrhythmias. Um, and then signs of kidney problems. And um, with this, of course, we're going to look for um, elevation in their creatinine, but also because that's a lab, but also in the function, because if someone's dehydrated um, or their kidneys aren't working, there's going to be less urine output. Oh, that was me trying to get you guys to answer there, but I didn't make that clear. So I apologize for the awkwardness. Anyway, uh, medical treatment for bowel obstruction is going to be to prevent infection and per perforation. So we do this, like um, the big thing with uh, bowel obstruction is we just need to keep the stomach decompressed, which helps with a lot of symptoms and helps stuff from backing up. They're, they're, uh, they're gonna do a lot better being NPO. If someone has a literal blockage or their bowels aren't contracting um, or intestines aren't contracting, then you know we do not need to be sticking anything in them. So NPO, NG tube, and remember these are the patients, good oral care all around. Um, blood cultures and antibiotics um, to make sure that there's no sort of infection going on. They may need, um, uh, what do you call it? Not that not everyone with a bowel obstruction gets infection, but we want to monitor. And it's not that antibiotics treat the bowel obstruction, but they treat if there's an infection. Um, and then keeping their fluids um, replaced. We, usually these patients are going to be on IV fluids. If their bowel obstruction is prolonged, they may be on the PPN, like the parenteral, uh, peripheral parenteral nutrition, um, or it's possible they could get TPN. Um, and then um, managing their pain and nausea. And if, uh, if it doesn't resolve on its own, they may need surgery, like a bowel resection. So as the nurse, I'm going to watch their intake and output closely. Again, monitoring that urine output to see if how their kidneys are doing. I'm going to monitor their emesis, which can tell me a lot if there's like complication happening, like bleeding, um, frequent oral care, lip lubrication. Is their mouth going to be dry? And these patients are miserable a lot of times because they have this NG tube in for days and they're hungry. And so, um, you know, this is not a nursing school answer, but in real life, you know, sometimes I'll throw them a bone. They have an NG tube. It's sucking everything out. So sometimes I let them like kind of, um, I'll have them, I'll let them take a sip of water because it gets sucked right back out. Very small little sips, not big gulps or anything like that, but um, a little sip of water just because it makes them feel like they have a little bit more control or I'll let them kind of um, chew a little bit on those sponges and stuff like that and swallow a little bit of it because it's going to get sucked right back up. Um, and then, um, but I'm, of course, trying to teach you the right way to do things, right? That's my awkward wink. Um, 
I also want to make sure to do serial abdominal assessment. So regular checks for their contour to make sure that they're not getting too um, bloated, things like that. Um, or there's no signs of that, that they're getting towards peritonitis, like that rigid abdomen. I'm going to keep them probably on an ECG monitor and be looking closely at their rhythm um, and looking for signs of dehydration in my assessment. And then just maintaining that NG tube and making sure that it's staying patent. I had a patient with a bowel obstruction a month or two ago, and um, his NG tube wasn't working. His um, stomach wasn't decompressed and we weren't getting a lot out and it really was affecting how he was feeling. So I'm um, maintaining that patency, making sure things are still working well. Um, and then uh, comfort and rest, helping position them and work with them so that they're comfortable. I think that's it. All right. Yeah. So next is the probably the shortest video I'll have. It's about polyps. I'll see you there.